Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to Building Matters, our webinar series hosted by the City of Richmond's Buildings Department. Uh, my name is Saper Forushani. Uh, we are very excited today to have uh, a very interesting conversation about uh, codes and standards uh, regarding uh, energy efficient buildings here in Canada. Uh, as I mentioned, my name is Saper. I have been with the City of Richmond for a couple of years now as building energy specialist. Uh, so I'm mainly responsible for the implementation of energy efficiency regulation, uh, specifically the BC Energy Step Code. Uh, prior to joining the City of Richmond, I worked at Simon Fraser University uh, and with the City of Surrey, where I looked at uh, energy efficiency in the built environment and also for district energy. Uh, systems. My graduate work uh, has been mostly focused on buildings, different aspects, including energy modeling tools uh, and uh, simulation techniques. We are very excited today to host uh, Rob Bernhardt, uh, whom I don't think needs much uh, introduction. Uh, he has been in the field of high performance buildings for many, many years now, and he's uh, uh, has been an avid advocate for energy efficiency and high performance buildings. Uh, Rob and I have been talking about all things energy and buildings related for almost a year now. Uh, we have had many stimulating conversations. I've learned a lot from him. So uh, at some point, we decided that maybe we should uh, make our conversation, our ongoing conversation, a bit more public so others can also uh, hear about some of the issues that we see in the regulatory landscape in Canada, again, as far as building energy efficiency is concerned. Uh, so, as most of you know, Rob is now uh, acting as advisor in projects and policy with Passive House Canada. Uh, so, we are fortunate that now he's spending a lot of time in advocacy and uh, education. But prior to that, Rob has been active in the development and uh, uh, sale of high performance houses. So, he knows what it takes to build a high efficiency, high performance house. So I mentioned uh, Rob's recent uh, education, outreach, and research activities. Uh, one of the very recent articles that he published in a peer-reviewed, uh, very high-profile journal uh, is called Advances Toward the Net Zero Global Building Sector. So there's a link to that article in the event page. If you haven't had a chance, I definitely recommend that you take a look. Uh, I think I should also mention that uh, three of Rob's co-authors uh, in that article are contributors and co-authors in the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Assessment Reports. So a very high profile team of researchers where, uh, and they have done a, a comprehensive survey of the state of the art in our collective efforts in moving toward net zero energy uh, buildings globally. Uh, he has also been publishing a series of articles, uh, uh, policy series focusing on policy through Passive House Canada, uh, a couple of the recent ones are very relevant to the topics that we're going to discuss today. There's also uh, links to those articles on the uh, event page. Uh, while we were discussing this and preparing this webinar, uh, a report also came out, which is again very relevant, pretty much looking at the same issue and coming to uh, conclusions similar to what uh, we are going to talk about today. So the report came out of Efficiency Canada out at uh, Carleton University in Ottawa. So they're looking at uh, basically the code development processes and the regulatory uh, frameworks uh, for buildings in Canada. And some of the conclusions, as I mentioned, is that, okay, well, we're making progress slowly, but we need to uh, change things in our processes, systems of code development, and in our approach. Uh, the issue of energy codes, uh, building energy codes in Canada and some of their shortcomings has uh, also seen some uh, media coverage uh, recently. So these are just uh, two of the recent articles in, you know, where journalists are also uh, becoming interested in uh, what's happening on the national level uh, and the, uh, again, our move towards energy efficient buildings in Canada. So, uh, Without further ado, I'm going to pass it on to Rob. Uh, the way we have structured this uh, webinar today is that Rob and I are going to have, uh, you know, sort of a virtual conversation back and forth, covering some of the issues that we think are uh, pertinent and uh, urgent as far as the our codes and standards are concerned. So we're going to go back and forth talking about some of these issues that we have identified, 
Uh, and then at the end, we're going to have hopefully enough time for comments and uh, discussion. So if you have questions, please uh, send them in through the chat feature. Uh, but uh, we're going to hold on until the end of the presentation before we get into the questions. So the first part, uh, Rob is going to tell us what it is that we need from our uh, energy codes, what it is that climate scientists are telling us uh, we have to do in the building sector in order to achieve our climate targets and ambitions. So Rob, please take it away. And, and thank you very much for those uh, introductory remarks. I think that uh, sets the stage very well. And just uh, by way of a, a bit of background and why uh, Pathos Canada and, and myself at the time became interested in the whole sort of policy codes and regulations field and, and why we engaged as we did earlier on, which has really uh, placed us in a position to make a few comments now, is that uh, the mandate of Passports Canada is market transformation. And our members have always felt that the way to achieve market transformation is to have an effective regulatory system. The, the, the required transformation to address climate change will not happen through voluntary measures, voluntary standards, that sort of thing. So if we want to achieve that goal, the way to do it is to and to build the industry capacity so that the regulations uh, can actually be implemented. And uh, before Canada started on the path, or BC even started on the path to develop things like our national building strategy, the BC Step Code, we had the opportunity to engage at the international level in developing uh, what became the UN Framework Guidelines for Energy Efficiency Standards in Buildings. And we thought, well, why not try and create some global benchmarks? And that would offer some guidance uh, within Canada. So, so we did that. And we engaged in that process. Uh, I ended up uh, ultimately chairing the meeting that did the bulk of the sort of drafting of the original version of those guidelines. And uh, they've since been revised. We just had a meeting September 11th where the group of experts, of which I'm a member, approved a, a revised set of guidelines that are more specific. There'll be more on them in a minute. But, uh, but that process was, was an interesting process, and it engaged us with other aspects of the international community. And what we have seen around the world is that many of the, particularly the UN-related agencies, the, they begin from the, a climate science perspective. Because what buildings need to achieve is actually an issue that is answered by climate science. Uh, it isn't a building engineering issue. It isn't a policymaker issue. It's just climate physics and uh, our carbon budget and that type of thing. So at the international level, what they took was that science-based approach and took the advice from uh, the IPCC and other groups and said, all right, this is how far we need to go. This is how long we've got to get there. And then our responsibility as a group of policymakers was to sort out how we're going to do that. And that's what the UN framework guidelines were intended to do. And then you'll see initiatives that sprung from the Paris Accord, like the Global Alliance for Buildings and Construction, which is the UN mandated uh, initiative to transform buildings, uh, that has guidelines that are aligned, or goals and pathways that are aligned with the UN framework guidelines. And then we see Canada coming in with the Pan-Canadian framework and engaging in the Paris Accord. And again, that level uh, is, is aligned as well. And in BC, because I know a number of the audience are from BC, uh, we've got Clean BC, the provincial policy that mandates that buildings shall be 80% more efficient than they are today. Uh, that's a big number. And uh, that's not 80% in heating and cooling, that's 80% overall. So these are uh, these high level policy commitments are, are ambitious and they need to be, and they're broadly aligned with climate science. If you have the next slide, please, Zephyr. The, um, so all of, all of that work and those bodies really, and the paper to the academic paper that uh, Zephyr just outlined, make it clear that to mitigate climate change, there's four imperatives for buildings. Buildings have many other imperatives. We also need to adapt to climate change. We need to provide health and comfort and resiliency, uh, structural, fire and safety. All these things need to be done. 
But if we're talking just about climate change mitigation, there are four things on the list. The first one is operating energy efficiency. And uh, the universal consensus is that operating energy efficiency must be, a f must be maximized. It is not a viable option to try and uh, allow buildings to go half measures in terms of efficiency and simply increase the supply of renewable energy. For a whole lot of reasons that are beyond the scope of this webinar, uh, you will see it universally accepted that energy efficiency needs to be maximized for the world and for nations to meet their climate commitments. Uh, the second imperative is that those operating requirements need to be met through renewable energy sources. We've got to move away from uh, fossil energy sources and decarbonize the energy system. And the third aspect is that embodied carbon, the carbon or the energy that goes into the construction of a building in materials and transportation, all those different things, and also in its end of life uh, uh, disposal or recycling, that needs to be minimized as well. And just as with operating efficiency, the targets for embodied carbon need to be, if they aren't at a level that today, most people in industry today don't actually know how to achieve, then they're not ambitious enough. We actually need to be inspiring innovation and capacity building in that field, just as we do with the operating energy efficiency. So those are the three sort of steps that need to be taken. And the four, that leads to the fourth imperative, which is to do those three things as rapidly as possible so that we can move forward. Um, by the way, we've got images of projects as we go through the slides. These are all Canadian Passivos projects. And uh, just some images for those, maybe some of you that haven't seen a lot of them. But the reality is we now have buildings at this level of performance <clears throat> all over the country, all kinds of different scales, different types of uses. Uh, what we're seeing in the millions of square feet that have been developed is that we have thousands of Canadians who can do this. And uh, the, the fears of cost and that sort of thing simply aren't materializing. So enjoy the photos as we scroll by. I don't plan to comment on the specific projects. Uh, so when we look at the operating energy efficiency, we get that the first target was, uh, sorry, that being the first target, that's what regulators have looked at around the world first. So Canada's done that with its national building strategy. BC actually got an earlier start with the BC energy step code. And uh, the, the question is, if we're looking at operating energy efficiency, what, what does efficient mean? Uh, how efficient should it be? And the conclusion is, as I said earlier, it should be maximized. Well, what's that? The, and the answer is that the International Passive House Standard of Energy Efficiency is the most stringent globally recognized standard in the world. And it has been implemented at scale around the world. And as we'll hear a little bit more about uh, later on. Uh, it is clearly doable, and that's one of the key findings in the academic paper, is given the thousands of projects around the world, uh, it is simply not tenable to say it can't be done. Uh, we know it can be done. We know it can be done affordably. And uh, to argue otherwise at this stage is simply to make an argument that is, in fact, based. So that standard, knowing that we can at least do that, has become sort of the recognized benchmark. And uh, you'll see it popping up in all kinds of places, whether it's in the Toronto Green Standard, in the BC Energy Step Code, uh, in the UN Framework Guidelines. Even if you look at, say, Clean BC, their goal of 80% more efficient. You know, if you're not doing at least passive house, you're, you're not going to get there. So it's that level of performance has become the recognized level. And uh, the, the excerpt of the proposed revision of the UN Framework Guidelines makes that really quite clear. You'll see some targets there, uh, 15 kilowatts per meter for new builds, 25 for retrofits. And uh, again, that's saying there should be clear performance outcomes that buildings need to meet. Uh, they include a definition of unconditioned floor area. So that's 
let's say 15 kilowatts per meter of conditioned floor area, not gross floor area. So, and then also there's a recognition that this is a starting point. Like we know we, this can be done today and we need to be looking for ways to do better. So rather than sort of searching and finding examples where people have done less, we should be focusing on how we can do better. And the next slide, please, Zephyr. Thank you. Um, we can see, and I mentioned earlier, China as an example. And uh, often we tend to think of Europe as a leader in these high performance buildings. Uh, certainly in the early years, we tended to get the components and the examples and that sort of thing from there. Now we've got quite a few components being made in Canada. But China is leading the pack. They took what Europe was doing. Uh, they learned from it. They are now manufacturing components that Europe doesn't have. And they're doing it at scale. They have individual projects that are over a million square meters. That's, you know, in 10 to 15 million square feet in one project. And uh, so the scale they're doing this at is, is amazing. And they're also scaling up their industry and their companies, their window companies, their mechanical companies are setting up Canada. Their prefabrication companies are selling entire prefabricated buildings to Canada. Anchorage, Alaska is getting a 12 story, $60 million hotel delivered from China with the art hanging on the walls and the furniture installed. That doesn't leave a lot of work for Canadian designers, builders, or furniture salespeople. And uh, so if, if we don't learn to meet this standard, then, uh, then our industry is going to be at an economic disadvantage. Um, last year, as an example, I was invited to speak in China at a prefabricated passive house buildings conference. They have an entire conference just dedicated to prefabricated passive house. So uh, it's, it's moving on a whole different scale there, and it, it represents in a way the direction the world is going. You'll see with Europe, they've got the energy directive for, uh, sorry, the, the, uh, the directive for energy performance in buildings that's requiring uh, near zero construction as of this year. And they're moving ahead in many ways too, but what's happening in China is spectacular. Now, up on your screen is a table that came out of the paper we wrote, uh, uh, the academic paper that we wrote, uh, and it's a table sort of mapping out the relative energy performance of buildings in different countries. And uh, you'll see way over to the left of the table a little dotted line that says the passive house level of performance. So it's a set at the 15 kilowatt level. Uh, and it shows how much more than that the uh, buildings in different countries are are consuming. That table is included in the paper in the context of a discussion of how energy use in buildings is measured. And the paper is pointing out how the units of measurement are not aligned. Different loads are included in different databases. It's virtually impossible to know, you know, what we see all these different bars in different countries. It's almost impossible to know who's included what in which measure. And that was one of the issues identified in the paper is a lack of commonality in the units of measurement. But uh, whatever these different measures are including or not including, because I think some are including only heating and cooling and some are including everything. But um, it's very clear that we in Canada have a long ways to go to improve our buildings. That tinkering around, making them 10%, 20%, 30% better isn't going to get us where we need to go. We need to transform the buildings, and that is going to require us to do things differently than what we've done before. We, we can't, as Einstein, I think, famously said many years ago, we can't solve a problem with the same thinking that created it. So we are, our, our ways of doing things simply have to change. And... So understanding that as a context of, of where we need to go, spend a few minutes uh, talking about the regulatory landscape in Canada. 
And uh, next slide. So at the high level policy level, we've got to sort of first out of the gate and dealing with you know, specific energy performance in particular, uh, we have the BC Energy Step Code. And of course, there's been earlier regulations dealing with, um, with, with energy use in buildings, but the, the BC Energy Step Code really was a change in thinking. And so we tend to think of it as a, as a milestone. Uh, one of the outcomes agreed to through that process was the buildings should be designed to achieve specific performance outcomes measured in kilowatts per square meter. And um, that, that's very different. The, the, uh, and then it would be up to designers and builders to achieve those outcomes. Uh, the na development of the National Building Strategy called Build Smart, Canada's Building Strategy, developed or started a little later than the uh, BC Energy Step Code started. And in the end, it came up with rather than absolute metrics like the step code had, it uh, used the term net zero ready to say that's what buildings need to be. And they set the date of 2030 for that. And the, the national strategy is more of a higher level policy document than the step code. And it required sign off by all the provincial territorial ministers. This wasn't going to be agreement on specific metrics uh, within the time available. So we had those two relatively high level policies adopted. Uh, Passports Canada was active in developing both of them. And we were really pleased with the outcomes from both the step code and the national building strategy. Both represented a fundamental shift in thinking. And in our view at the time charted out and we believe still do chart a viable path forward for the buildings we need. However, in the intervening years, uh, what we've seen is that the implementation process is becoming increasingly disconnected from the original policy objectives. And the implementation is the responsibility of different people and different groups than the policy development. So the implementation of the step code it falls under a variety of sources, but the over, you know, the, the governing body is really the BC Energy Step Code Council. And under the national, uh, model national building code, it falls under our national code development system, the Canadian Commission for Buildings and Power Code. So we've got this uh, emerging disconnect between the policy creation and then the policy implementation. So next slide, please, Deborah. In the federal context, uh, it's a big, uh, complex system. I, I think most people would agree it's complex. Uh, this is a diagram, an organizational chart for the Canadian, showing how the Canadian Commission on Buildings and Fire Codes is structured. Uh, this, all the little groups within it uh, comprise hundreds of people. The one little box, sort of more towards the bottom, a white one, SC-EEB, that uh, used to refer to the Standing Committee Energy Efficiency in Buildings. It's had its name changed, but um, it's a standing committee. And if you go, that's really the key one for the purpose of this discussion. Uh, and if you go to one of those meetings, you'll see you know 20 to 40 people in a room. Uh, not all of them are voting members, but there's quite a sizable collection of people. And uh, they're you know a small cog in a bigger system. Uh, next slide, please, Zephyr. So when we look at that uh, sort of system, uh, what we have seen over the intervening years since the high-level policies were adopted is that there hasn't been the clear direction and leadership that we were hoping to see. You know, there's multiple ministries, all kinds of departments and different programs involved. And uh, when I've gone to Ottawa or talked to provincial staff and asked, you know, who's leading this? You know, Take me to your leader. They can't tell me who that is. If the transformation of buildings were a project, there's no project manager who has the mandate and the responsibility to make sure the outcomes specified are actually achieved within the timelines that have been given. So, uh, 
So there isn't that sort of clear and consistent direction. You get lots of different interpretations of what net zero ready might mean, that type of thing. So, so that's part of it. And then if we look at the code committees themselves, we, we see that the normal conflict of interest policies that apply in, to most organizations aren't enforced in these groups. There will be representatives on these committees of companies, of industry associations, uh, different governments. And some of these people have an actual direct conflict of interest with change, with the change in the building code. It's going to cost them money. Their business model is set up around the status quo and changes are, are going to require the expenditure of money. They may be selling products that uh, meet current standards and they don't want to retool. But there's, it's not uncommon to see these sort of conflicts of interest and they, they don't recuse themselves. They get to, if they're a voting member, they still get to vote, they still get to speak. Um, and uh, so we've got a variety of different interests. They're unaligned interests around the table. Uh, we also, sitting around the table, don't have a lot of people who have ever actually delivered these projects. Uh, they may be engineers, they may be architects, they may be whatever, but they haven't actually done these buildings. So there's a lot of fairly broad misunderstanding of what's possible, what's involved, how hard it is, that type of thing. And... Uh, we add to that the fact that in this large group, their mandate is to function on a consensus basis. So the committee leadership is left trying to get a consensus from this large group of unaligned people. And inevitably, if you take a, reach a consensus from a large group of varying interests and abilities, uh, you're going to end up with a mediocre result. Like that just isn't a formula for obtaining excellence. And um, they and also progress is going to be very slow and very difficult. And we see the timeline slipping in the code development process. So we've got this process that just really hasn't been able to cope with the changes required. And that's not a surprise because our building code system wasn't set up to lead this kind of transformational change. It may do lots of other things very well, but it actually wasn't constituted to do what we now need to do. Next slide, please. So, uh, Passwords Canada has been engaged in this. Uh, Chris Ballard, our CEO, recently wrote to the federal ministers involved on one issue. There's an example here from just a Green grab from our website, uh, a letter he wrote to the federal ministers involved in a decision to not require air tightness testing on a large variety of buildings. And uh, as many of you on this webinar will know, if a building isn't tested for its air tightness, there's actually no way to know how efficient it is. And it can lead to a number of other problems too with moisture in walls and so on. But uh, you know, you just can't hit any target unless you're testing. And apparently the concern was, it was hard to know exactly what the reasons were, but apparently it related to the service may not be available in some parts of Canada. It's widely available in many parts. Um, there was a similar level of anxiety before the step code was introduced in BC. It turned out to be a non-issue. But the, the reality is with most services, they don't exist until there's a market for them. And where there is no market because there's no regulation requiring it, you're not going to get the service offered. And this is a service with very low barriers to entry. The equipment is inexpensive. It doesn't take much to gear up. And uh, certainly that service can be geared up far faster than any building code can be implemented. So that, that's one example where we, if you don't air to tightness test, we just don't know. Another example is the reference building approach or percent better than approach. That was uh, the BC Energy Step Code uh, recently decided to permit for Part 9 buildings. And also the National uh, Code Committee has decided that they would permit as well. And that just to, to explain what it is, 
it's a uh, it's a code compliance tool. It isn't actually designed to predict actual performance. It's a tool to comply with a building code. And what it does is it compares the energy use of a proposed building to a fictional building of the same design, and that's called the reference building, and calculates in percentage terms how much more efficient the proposed building is than it could have been if built to a minimum building code standard. So, uh, so that's what it does. It just says it's 20% better or 30% better or whatever it might be, better than it could have been. But it does not give an accurate prediction of what the energy load, uh, energy use of the building actually will be. So in that respect, it's a major contributor to the what's known as the performance gap in buildings, which is endemic to the industry. And that's the, the gap between what people are expecting a building to do when they're designing it and how a building actually performs once it's in use. So with that uh, sort of introduction to the code system and a couple of the issues we've, we've seen with it, uh, I'll turn it back to Zephyr and he can say a little bit more about Richmond and uh, what it's found with the step code. Uh, thank you, Rob. Yeah, I think this uh, reference building approach is a very clear illustration of some of these systemic problems that you're talking about. And that's why I want to spend just a few minutes talking about these la latest changes to the uh, BC Energy Step Code and their implications. So just a quick overview for those who are not necessarily involved or familiar with uh, this new uh, performance-based code in BC. So the step code is really looking at the energy performance of buildings in terms of three uh, metrics. One of them is the so-called TEDI, which looks at the thermal efficiency of your building envelope. And it's expressed in terms of the kilowatt hour per square meter uh, annually needed to heat the building for space heating. And that's uh, directly, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, correspondent to the 15 kilowatt hour per square meter that Rob was mentioning. Uh, as the, you know, the universally accepted and adopted benchmark. Then we're looking at the air tightness of the building. So basically the rate of uh, leakage into the building, uh, which is measured and uh, looked at in terms of the ACH. And then we have finally the so-called MUI, uh, which looks at the mechanical energy use of the building. So the idea here is that in these three metrics in combination give a complete picture of how well the building has been designed and constructed in terms of the building envelope, and then how efficient these mechanical equipment uh, are for running the building and uh, for air conditioning and other services. So now the inclusion of these two first metrics, the TEDI and the air tightness metric, the ACH, is really based on the so-called envelope first approach, which is you know based on just very basic building science, uh, which essentially means that the best and most sustainable way of achieving energy efficiency and net zero energy readiness in the building sector is to start with a highly efficient building envelope, which is also airtight. So that was uh, recognized in the procedure uh, leading up to the development and adoption of the energy step code. So that was great. This was recognized and that was the reason we had these uh, three different metrics. Now, what happened last year uh, last November, and I think coming into effect last December, was that there was a revision to the building code, as you know, uh, is usual every couple of years or every year. And then in that revision, among the changes pertaining to energy efficiency and the energy step code specifically, a new metric and a set of new targets were introduced for looking at the uh, thermal performance of your building envelope. So here in this table, I have we don't need to you know, get into all the details. I'm happy to discuss that uh, in the question uh, and answer section. But we had these targets for different steps, starting at step one and then leading up to step five, which is the stated end goal of the step code by 2032, and that's equivalent to uh, net zero energy uh, readiness. So we had these uh, targets for TEDI, indicator of the thermal efficiency of the building envelope. The first change introduced last year was that uh, the province introduced an adjustment to this target. And as you see in the table, there is a minor, a relatively minor discrepancy. And, you know, basically it has become somewhat more lenient, which is, you know, uh, cause for concern. But compared to the second change, which was the introduction of these relative performance targets, 
the reference building approach that Rob introduced, uh, you know, this is the real problem now. And I remember when the when there was a uh, com some some communication from the building uh, st safety and standards uh, branch from the province last year. There was an email saying, "Well, look, the new uh, revision to the code is uh, coming into effect in a few weeks, and these are some of the changes." And I was going through that, and I was obviously interested in stuff relating to the step code. And I went across, I came across these relative performance targets. And I remember I looked at the target for step two and I looked at five percent and I was going, really? How are you even going to measure that? Is, is it even meaningful uh, given all the building energy modeling tools that we have to talk about five percent improvement? And that aside, that methodological question aside, is that even significant? Is that going to drive the change that we need to see in our building sector to move to our uh, net zero energy readiness in a span of you know almost a decade now, so that got my interest, and I started looking into that in more detail. And you know, fast forward into a year later, I have spent a lot of time looking at data from our jurisdiction in Richmond and also uh, other municipalities in our area. And then, to just sum it up very concisely, I think this graph will tell uh, what's happening there and what the core problems. So here you see the average improvement in the thermal efficiency of the building envelope that we would get based on the original absolute performance targets. And here we're now looking at steps two, three, and four, uh, just for simplicity, but you can extend the analysis to the entire range from step one to step five. So these were the original targets prior to December 2019, prior to the latest revision to the code. And then those adjusted targets that I talked about, the minor adjustment introduced to still absolute num numbers are making things a bit easier. But then you look at the relative targets, so the intended improvement over the so-called reference house, and then you see there is this major discrepancy between what was originally proposed and put in place, which as Rob mentioned, is informed by climate science. It's not some arbitrary number that we come up with. This is based on the fact that, you know, the end goal is to achieve 15 kilowatt hours per square meter annually in order to make net zero energy buildings a reality. So you look at that, the kind of blue bars here, and then you look at the red bars, which is what you will get from the new relative targets. And of course, if you have a more lenient target, a more lenient, more easily achievable uh, pathway in the building code, of course, that's going to encourage people to take the easier route. Now, I should mention that this entire reference building approach is not new per se. Even in the original energy step code, there was a similar uh, set of targets and a set of metrics for the overall energy performance of the building or the mu target or the mechanical equipment that I talked about. So there was a similar uh, approach, which is still, of course, in place. But then, frankly, that was not a major uh, cause of concern, at least for me, because when I looked at the three metrics, I knew that the Teddy is the more important one. And then based on the original targets, it was the more uh, challenging one to achieve. So even though we had the same uh, fundamental methodological problem with the reference house targets or the relative targets in terms of the MUI, uh, that was not a great cause of concern because we knew Teddy is the real driver of change and is really what we need to achieve for net zero energy readiness. But now by extending that approach, which is of course uh, also the approach taken in the national code, we are really watering down the energy step code. And our concern, as I'm going to go through quickly, is that we're not going to be able to achieve the goals uh, that we have and we must achieve uh, with this current code. Now, just to illustrate the problem and the, the disconnect that uh, Rob mentioned and then the discrepancy that we see in these targets now, let's take a look at this graph. Now, one of the problems with this reference house approach is that, as Rob mentioned, this reference house is a fictional hypothetical building where you're uh, in your building energy modeling, you're saying, okay, so I have this proposed design. What if I had built the same house, the same you know, form factor, geometry, orientation, all that, with the, to the code minimum requirements, the prescriptive requirements of the code? How would have this uh, my house performed had I built it to code minimum? And then you run that in your energy model and you compare it to the energy performance of your proposed house. And now you, you compare the two. 
But then the problem, of course, is that if you change your design for every single house that you design and intend to build, you're going to have a different uh, bar because the reference house is a function of the design of your building. So this graph here is showing kind of the histogram that distribution of uh, reference house uh, thermal energy demand intensities, again, the metric showing the thermal efficiency of the building envelope, from 40 or 39 different uh, houses in the lower mainland. So these are all houses of the same archetype. So these are single family dwellings in the same climate zone, climate zone four. And now you see that depending on my design, you know, where I'm putting my windows, how much window area I have, what is the orientation of the house, how much articulation I have in the building envelope. I have a very wide spectrum of uh, my reference house, Teddy. And so if I'm talking, if you're talking about, okay, we now want to see 5%, 10%, 20% improvement, the question is 10% improvement over which of these reference houses. And again, remember the target, the, uh, you know, the universally accepted and adopted target is 15 kilowatt hours per square meter. That's the end goal. That's where we need to get in, you know, 10, 12 years time. But now, if I'm taking one of the you know, inherently inefficient designs on the right end of the spectrum where the reference house is performing very poorly, to achieve that end goal means 80% improvement. Whereas if I take one of the more efficient designs, inherently efficient designs, that means around 60% improvement. So you have this very wide gap of what it means in relative terms to achieve our end target of net zero energy ready, and then what does the building code currently propose for step five, which is supposed to be net zero energy ready? 50%. So that is cause of great concern. And uh, I know Rob has looked at this in more detail in terms of what it means in, uh, you know, in opening this entire process to gaming the system. So I'm going to hand it back to him to give us a few very interesting but kind of scary examples. And then I'll talk about uh, a bit more about some of the actions we have taken. So Rob, back to you. Okay. okay. Thanks, Pepper. Uh, yeah, that's that's really interesting. And seeing the actual data now coming out uh, from buildings that are being built uh, within your jurisdiction, I think is really illustrative and allows the, the issue to be brought forward. I'd like to just perhaps start with a couple of anecdotes before I speak to this uh, this sort of diagram that we've got up right now. And that uh, because I'm going to be speaking now about the reference building approach to show another issue with it. But the reference building approach is, is thought perhaps by some at any rate to be necessary or appropriate because the absolute targets are too hard to hit. But what we're seeing now in BC, and it'll the same issue will come up across the country once the new codes come in, uh, is that the targets under the step code are simply the absolute targets are absolutely too easy as uh, builders are being trained how to build them. And there's interesting little anecdotes uh, coming out. And there was one uh, recently, a builder from a you know, smaller cold climate, climate zone six uh, interior uh, community that is not uh, has not adopted the step code, uh, was saying that he's going to put uh, the homes that he's building, you know, spec homes, he's going to make them step three. He's asked why, and his answer is, because uh, he clearly doesn't need to do that, why? Well, it's cheaper than what I'm building now, uh, what I have been building. Well, what do you mean cheaper? Well, I can use poorer windows and less insulation. And uh, the, the market in that community was already demanding more than step three. Uh, the energy model that he's getting uh, demonstrated that he could build step three in, in climate zone six, a cold climate, relatively cold climate, um, with windows that are so poor performing double pane windows that uh, he would have to special order them. The, the local suppliers don't carry that level at the moment. And the same thing with insulation, he could get cheaper insulation. He normally gets a little better quality insulation. He could get the really cheap stuff, except it's not in stock. So he'd have to special order it. So he's actually gonna do a little better than step three because he doesn't want to special order these things. Uh, another one in sort of mid Vancouver Island climate zone five uh, is building a step five house. And again, you can see these steps are starting to be used as marketing labels uh, rather than performance outcome. And the reason is for a marketing advantage because in climate zone five, a home, these are single family homes, they can be built 
with two by six batten poly and R22 walls and cheap double pane windows. That's step five in climate zone five. And, uh, and you know, they're, they're being sold, they're competitive with the other homes being sold, just run of the mill spec homes. And uh, so the one builder is in an area where, you know, a number of builders are active building these spec homes and uh, is going to be doing that. Doesn't take the other builders long to figure out that, hey, somebody's going to be marketing a step five home next to my no name home. I better figure out what it's going to cost to do step five. And then the designs they're using, they needed to add, I think it was one inch of subfloor insulation to their design, sub, sub slab insulation to make step five. They don't need an HRV. They don't need a heat pump to do this. But they're putting those items in because they can't sell the homes without them. So those items are marketing pieces, not uh, performance requirements under the step code. So two by six batten poly, the cheap double pane windows, step five is not a high bar to get over. It's nowhere near where we need to be. It's only possible because of the different technical detailed inadequacies of the way in which we calculate the performance. It's such a loose and easy method right now. So, so those comments just uh, briefly in terms of the absolute targets that we have. Um, the diagram that's in front of you is a diagram of several different sort of theoretical floor plans. We all know that a, uh, in buildings, a cube is the most efficient sort of form of building in terms of uh, the ratio of wall area or envelope area to floor area. Um, and as we go up in complexity, the, you get more wall uh, per given floor area. And uh, most passive house buildings tend to be more cube-like or maybe the 20% more than. That's because it's impossible to, at an affordable price anyhow, uh, reach the performance metrics if you design a very complex building form. This is for small buildings. It's not such a factor with big buildings. But for a single family home, it's important. Uh, then what most people and most designers don't realize is that the average or normal budget track or spec home is about 150% of the envelope area of a cube. We have fallen into the habit of decorating the home with the envelope. In with vernacular architecture, you look at many of the beautiful old buildings we have around here. We decorated the envelope. We put a veranda on. We put a porch on. The garage is beside the house. There's a balcony. There's you know patios. There's other things to decorate with, uh, but we don't go in and out with the envelope. This diagram here illustrating 150% wall area. The ins and outs are exaggerated, but that's because we're only drawing in the two dimensions. There's a third dimension where the complexity gets added on with the ceiling or roof and the foundation or basement. So uh, we're just adding, a, exaggerating the jigs and drags here in the drawing to show the degree of the increase. But it's absolutely common in cheap sort of track spec homes to have an envelope area about 150% of the cube. And that makes the home very expensive, uh, relatively expensive, because you pay for all of this by the square meter. When you get into uh, McMansions or into custom homes or mansions themselves, the numbers are way higher. You can easily get into 250%, 300, 350%. So the spectrum, the range that we're showing here is a really normal range other than only a few people build at the efficient end of the range. Next slide, please, Zephyr. So here's a graph illustrating the Teddy that Zephyr was talking about thermal energy demand intensity. It's the heating and cooling loads for the building. The blue bars show the uh, theoretical amounts of thermal energy that a building complying with different levels of the step code would do, plus passive house. Many people thought when the step code was introduced and uh, identified 15 kilowatts per meter that that was passive house performance. In fact, the details are defined differently and it never was the same. There was initially some thought that it would, the definitions would be improved, so it would be the same. But right now, the step five home in uh, climate zone five is able to use about double the energy of a passive house. And this uh, measurement here is adjusting the passive house numbers to reflect uh, comparable measurement methods. So with a what the 
Orange and the gray bars show are the difference between the reference building performance and the proposed building performance when it proposed form of building when it's built to step five. So the orange bar represents the same house with different amounts of uh, envelope area. And the gray bar represents that same house built to the minimum code. So we can see beginning with the cube, you know, the uh, step five house is, you know, almost half of what the code minimum would be, which you would expect. But as the envelope complexity increases, so does the energy, so do the energy loads. So that the, by the time you get 150% of the envelope area using the reference building approach, that building is permitted to use about double the heating and cooling energy of an efficiently designed building. And that's because with the reference building, you're, you just need to show that you are a percent better than the reference building. And I've forgotten the, the details. I think it's something like 50% better. Zephyr can maybe correct me, but it's, it's about that. And um, the, so at 45 kilowatts per meter, it meets step five. And if we go into the uh, custom homes and McMansions, the mansions, uh, it, we can't fit it on this chart. So, so the people that are having to design on a budget and create a simple, affordable home, they need to meet a much higher level of performance than those people who aren't worried about the budget. So the inequity is rather striking. Next slide, please. Um, this is a graph showing, uh, it's a comparable sort of graph, but it's including what's commonly under in the part nine world in BC called But it's uh, without one. It just includes a broader basket of energy loads. I put it that way. Um, and there, it's, it's quite interesting. You can see, uh, you know, if you've got a step five building in the middle, the two columns, the orange and the gray, uh, it's a cube. The reference building and the uh, step five building are uh, roughly as you would expect. The uh, step five brings the loads down by about half. And then look at what happens to the permissible loads as you as the envelope area increases. If we go to the right-hand side, the reference building built, again, the same way as the cube was built, just more envelope area, its energy load goes up to 188. So if you've got to meet whatever it is, the 50-60% threshold there, I think it varies with building size, then you're allowed to consume like 90 kilowatts per meter, somewhere in that range. And so triple what a cube is allowed to consume. And again, if we get into the more expensive homes, then the, the numbers are much greater and they don't fit on this, this graph. So, uh, so the inequity of this thing uh, is, is striking. And Zephyr has mentioned the sort of different target for each home, not each archetype. Uh, and the, the targets vary primarily with the complexity of the design. Next slide, please, Jeffrey. Yeah, thanks, Rob. Before I talk about some of our uh, activity on this enrichment, I just wanted to go back to this plot that you talked about. I just want to reiterate and bring everybody's attention to the uh, to the column or the bars on the very right, step five Q with 150% more surface. So what's happening here, and this is really the core problem, I think this illustrates the problem very clearly. So. Under the relative performance regime, what I need to do basically is to lower the bar with an inherently efficient design. So I lower the bar, that gray uh, bar there, 91. So I lower it so much that with, you know, with doing a few basic things, I can achieve 50% improvement because, you know, achieving 50% improvement on such an inherently inefficient design is not going to be difficult. And then I'm going to put, you know, I'm going to call it step five and then, you know, all the marketing advantages that uh, Rob talked about. So I think this is very serious. Now, uh, as I mentioned, we have been looking into this for almost a year now. We recently took a report to the council uh, and this was received well. So we are now uh, writing letters. We are asking the uh, council and the mayor to write letters to the ministries involved and responsible for this. And we uh, really hope to see uh, these uh, missteps reversed 
uh, and then this relative uh, performance approach and targets uh, stricken out of the step code. Now, to summarize some of the points that we discussed in that report, uh, I just want to mention that I, we think this new approach, these new targets, uh, undermine the regulatory consistency of the province. And remember, the Building Act that came into effect here in BC was meant to provide a level playing field. And some of the examples and the anecdotes Rob has been talking about clearly shows that's not the case now. Uh, we are really concerned that decarbonization of the building sector will be very difficult, if at all possible, with these new, uh, you know, uh, targets, performance targets, because as we have been seeing, these aren't meaningful changes, and these are not going to drive or take us to net zero energy level uh, that we need to be at. Uh, so, if we assume that the goal remains the same, which has to, then with watering down these intermediate steps, you're creating a larger gap between where we're at, our status quo, and where we need to be in, you know, 10 years. And that's not a large, uh, you know, large inter interval. That's not a lot of time for a fundamental transformation of our market. Uh, so we are obviously seeing again, very clearly from the examples Rob has been give given us, that these new targets disintensifies and discourage excellence and innovation in the industry. Uh, there is also concern about how these changes were developed and implemented. I don't want to go into uh, too much detail here, but without being indiscreet, I just want to mention that we were very clear in our communication to the province from the get-go as soon as we identified the uh, issues, but unfortunately our warnings and concerns have not been taken seriously yet. Uh, we're going to come back to this later on, but uh, we also are concerned about all the other uh, implications uh, other than energy efficiency where these poorly performing houses will create serious problems. And then uh, we have uh, an upcoming code update by 2022, and we are concerned the same approach and same targets will be adopted in that code update. Uh, now, as I mentioned, it's not only about energy efficiency. Energy efficiency and achieving net zero energy level uh, performance of buildings is the first step. It has been the first step for a very long time, for a few decades now in Canada. And we need to move on, right? We need to achieve this uh, quickly so that we can look at things such as operational emissions. We need to look at our existing building stock. We need to think about things like thermal comfort, indoor air quality, I mean, here in BC, the recent wildfires that we all remember very well are a very, uh, I guess, clear indication of the new challenges that we face in the building sector. Our, you know, friends uh, on the East Coast have been facing heat waves, uh, you know, repeatedly the past few years. Uh, we need to talk about resilience and adaptation. We need to talk about embodied emissions, uh, such as uh, Rob mentioned in his four imperatives. So I guess what I'm trying to say here is now, Energy efficiency is the very first step. So if it's taking us so many iterations and so much time and energy to get that right on track, when are we ever going to get to these other topics, these other issues? So before we uh, open for questions, I just wanted to uh, you know, give the mic back to Rob to talk about what he sees as the way forward, what needs to be done. We've been talking about some systemic problems, some specific examples, some symptoms of these specific problems. But then we need to act on this, right? So simply just complain about it is not uh, going to cut it. So, Rob, what do we have to do? What is the way forward? Uh, thanks, Zephyr. In, in, in my view, the really uh, governments, for the most part, have declared a climate emergency. And it's essential that it be treated as an emergency, that business as usual won't address the issue. And, so, you know, we have processes that are established within government to sort of have us work with through issues over time uh, in the normal sort of way to deal with the routine matters. Uh, this, this won't get dealt with in that way. We need to look at it differently and do some things differently to make it happen. And uh, that, in my view, takes leadership within government. It, it isn't going to work with a bunch of different, even if they're great people, 
competent people working hard. It's not going to work with a bunch of different ones beavering away in different departments on different programs, all trying to figure out what net zero ready really means and, um, and without that clear guiding direction and commitment. So the both Efficiency Canada and ourselves in the report they wrote, the article that uh, Puzzles Canada published, are calling for a, a, a leader, a champion, somebody like that within government with a mandate that comes from the ministerial level to, to effectively implement the high-level policies we talked about at the beginning, to enable the cities and the provinces and the, the country to meet their goals. And so that's that's the really uh, what we think. These issues we've identified are, are not the only issues. They're just uh, symptomatic. Um, and that, that's what we need. So what can others on the call do? Uh, to me, it's really important that people speak up. Uh, the step code, as you mentioned, Zephyr, was, uh, was brought in to enable municipalities to meet their emissions and energy efficiency targets. And it didn't regulate emissions, but, you know, it was supposed to be a way of doing that. Um, and um, the, and municipalities in, under the Building Act lost their ability to regulate in other ways. So this is the tool the municipalities have been given. If it doesn't work, it's just essential that municipalities be vocal about that. And the practitioners that are on the call are those involved in, it wouldn't matter which municipality you're in in the country with the national code going the same way, the same issue exists everywhere. Uh, but everybody be vocal and recognize these issues. There's a very broad base of community support for this. People want better building on climate change. So I think there's a political platform for this. And those that are speaking up can be confident that they've got that kind of backing. And what they're really asking for is for government to effectively implement the policies that have been agreed to and to effectively achieve the commitments that have been made. So, so that, that's uh, what we see. The other thing that's unrelated to sort of the advocacy piece is everyone on, the, on this webinar to do whatever they can to ensure that the end state buildings we need are being delivered today. So that the public sector buildings, any projects you're involved in are actually delivering these projects. Often the resistance to change is based on the unsubstantiated fear that either you won't find the people to do it, the components aren't available, or they're too expensive. Uh, the reality is none of those fears are based in fact. Anybody in any area, can, not anybody can do it, but for anyone wanting to do it, we can get the resources in place. And uh, the buildings, the actual projects standing, uh, say more and speak more loudly than words ever will. Uh, it's just hard to say it can't be done or it's too expensive when you're looking at a building that just did it and didn't cost any more than the building next door. So, um, so those are sort of my thoughts and uh, I'd be really interested in hearing what others on the webinar have to say. Thank you very much, Rob. Uh, and I would like to invite everybody at this point to send in your questions or comments through the chat feature. We have had a few uh, questions already, so I'm just going to go through them. Uh, oops. Uh, yeah, we had a question from our friends in Township of Langley uh, asking whether the relative performance targets for the envelope has been uh, adopted or used by builders in Richmond, or whether I'm dealing with that discrepancy or disconnect. So uh, not yet, because as you probably know, for single family houses in Richmond, we're still at step one, where you're only required to show that your building performs better than code minimal or the so-called reference house. So we haven't uh, had that issue yet. Uh, in one project, in one townhouse project, for one of the buildings out of eight building blocks, uh, the builder for and the requirement there is step three. We saw uh, the use of the alternative pathway or the relative performance pathway. But we do anticipate to uh, see more of this issue as we move up the step code ladder. Uh, we are moving to steps two and three, 
uh, in the next couple of months. So we do definitely expect to see this becoming uh, a real challenge. And as I mentioned, a real challenge uh, for us achieving our uh, emission reduction goals. Uh, just going through the comments here, uh, there is a question from Robert uh, about how uh, BC, the province of BC, defines net zero energy ready and whether there is any assumption that you know improvement in renewable energy technology such as uh, higher efficiency PV will compensate the uh, kind of watered down uh, energy performance levels for the buildings. Uh, I'm going to defer to Rob on this, but my understanding is that Clean BC defines that target uh, roughly as 80% improvement, but I don't think there is an explicit definition for net zero energy ready in provincial uh, documents. Am I right, Rob? That's correct. And I, I'm not actually aware either of a formal definition for net zero energy ready uh, at the national level either. I, you know, it, it seems to vary still. People, there's various departments and programs who have different uh, ideas, but it's just not clearly defined. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, there's a question about what you mentioned, uh, Rob, about prefabricated passive houses. Is there any uh, regulatory barriers to that, or uh, is that easily done, basically, to import that prefab product well, and you know, sell it in Canada? Uh, it's very easy for me to say it's easily done because I'm not actually doing it. But uh, the uh, but there's a number of manufacturers in BC and elsewhere, other provinces that are doing it. I I heard when prefab first came in, there was a number of sort of regulatory, more to do with inspections and so on, uh, barriers. Uh, obviously, those barriers have been addressed in some manner because these buildings are going up all over the place, um, and. Um, but I can't speak to specifically what they did. I think the, um, the, the these sorts of things, you know, there's all kinds of little wrinkles. And no project, no matter what you're doing, is ever simple. But um, they managed to, to work these things out. So, uh, so all I can say is they're happening. Okay. Uh, thank you, Rob. Uh, there's a comment or question about the content of this webinar. So uh, we have been recording this webinar and it will be posted on our YouTube channel. So uh, all the participants will receive a follow-up email with link to that webinar and links to the articles that we've been discussing. About the uh, letter from the uh, Richmond City Council that I mentioned, the letter has not been sent out yet, but uh, I can provide a link to the staff report that uh, went to the uh, went to the council and was approved. Uh, there is a comment about uh, the need for uh, training and uh, you know creating buy-in from uh, municipal staff and city councils. Rob, I know you've been active on that front. Uh, is there anything that you would like to share with us in your outreach efforts to different uh, elected officials? Yeah, the. Uh... Council of Canada would be uh, pleased to provide any information elected officials or staff uh, may wish to have. What we're able to speak to is the capacity to deliver these projects and how much training it actually is. People are afraid that somehow this is hard work, that it's really hard to do or really expensive, and it's just not. Like We, we, we train thousands. Others are training uh, Many people too. We probably train more than anyone else, but others are training as well. And it, it doesn't take that long. The Canadian Home Builders Association has good training programs. You know, a professional builder, at least in BC, can do these very easily. Um, one, one example, just I didn't mention earlier, but an anecdote about how low these standard, how low these bars are to step over. There was, of course, when the step code was being introduced, a great deal of anxiety from from builders and, and others involved. So there was a group uh, in Kamloops that was concerned. I don't mind naming this city. And BC Hydro had the brainwave. Well, they were expressing concern. Well, we can't do this. It's too hard, too ambitious, you know, it's too much. And uh, so BC Hydro said, well, why don't we just model and do a blower door test on some of the projects you're building today like before the step code comes in? Let's just see what you're doing and see what you need to do. What does it actually mean in your climate? So this is colder central BC climate, cold and dry. And uh, they did that. And it turns out these 
builders who were concerned about meeting really any level of performance on the step code were already building step three and they didn't know it. They were doing it inadvertently. Uh, but that's just what the market was requiring. That's where the market is. So these levels that we're talking about, this isn't hard to do. And most important for municipal staff and for council members is to be confident that that's the case. Our builders can do this. Our designers can do this. And um, just you will often hear from people who don't wish to change, but it really takes that understanding of what is happening in the market to be confident that change can happen sooner than people realize. Yeah, and I can uh, attest to that from our standpoint uh, here in, uh, in Richmond that, uh, as I mentioned, uh, we have been at step one, the very first step for single family houses for about two years now. And uh, there was a lot of concern across the province, including in Richmond, about uh, readiness and how much effort it will take our builders even to adopt this entire framework and do step one, you know, incorporating energy modeling in their design and construction processes, doing the air tightness. Uh, measurement and all that. But then now we are seeing, looking at the results, looking at the outcome, we're seeing that the builders are running with it, right? So uh, on average, about 65 houses that have been built to uh, or required to meet step one, on average, they perform equivalent to step two. So we are seeing ample evidence that builders are willing to up their game. They would like to introduce uh, innovation and excellence. They would like to provide and sell a better product in the market. So what we are trying to do and what we should be doing is to provide support and encouragement. So I can definitely echo your comments, Rob, that you know, some of these fears or concern uh, are not real. We are seeing that builders are able, you know, in fact, we have had builders who, again, the requirement for them was only step one. So there is no uh, set or tightness limit on that. But we have had builders building passive house level airtight houses. So of course the overall energy performance is not uh, near the passive house standard, but airtightness, which was perceived to be one of the main challenges, is not an issue. On average, we're looking at step uh, two level uh, airtightness performance. We have had several houses uh, with less than one air changes per hour. So that's step five or passive house level. So simply not an issue for the builders. Uh, looking at more comments, uh, Megan says we need clear data to disprove the affordability narrative that the status quo pushes to instill fear and prevent the required transformation. Uh, so any further comments on the affordability side of uh, the story, Rob? Sure. You know, we, we can walk around streets in many cities now and point to passive house and the, its cost is indistinguishable from another house next door on the same street. And uh, the people that raise the affordability flag, the first question to ask is how many of these have they designed and built? The answer almost invariably is zero. And they're generally not trained in how it's done either. Uh, secondly, ask for their data. Like there is uh, data all over the place and the academic paper that we published contains references from around the world on cost. Uh, so, and we have cost data here. I used to build and sell them, so I know. Uh, but um, the ask them for data. There is no data supporting the fact that they are expensive. All they have, all they can do is raise the fear and avoid the use of costing study because they're just, they're, they're an irrelevant trap, if I can say that. And that's the typical response of government. It's to do a hypothetical study of what a better building would cost. That isn't how buildings are designed or built. So the costing studies you see, they assume that the building design doesn't change. We have to change the design. That's how you reduce the cost. So if you're going to take an inefficient design, try to make it expensive. You don't need a study to tell us that's expensive. Or sorry, try to make it efficient. You don't need a study to say that's going to be expensive. Uh, what we can say with absolute confidence is somebody says it can't be done. The response at this point is, well, your competition is doing it. And uh, ask for data. You, the onus at this point is on them. We have data from around the world and Canada 
showing this is affordable. If they're saying it's not affordable, the, the onus is really on them to come forward with data. And uh, I've never seen actual data brought forward. Uh, thank you, Rob. Uh, and then if I may ask, you talked about the cube form as being the inherently most efficient form. Uh, in your experience as you know, developer of passive houses, how does the buyer, how, how does the homeowner see? Because you know, even when I have some of these conversations with my colleagues, I get the reaction that you know we don't want to sell cubes to people. How does the home buyer see that simple but efficient form? They need if they don't believe if they've got a designer telling them that a simple form can't be attractive. They need a different designer. Uh, the, and the story I tell, this was a long time ago. There was a developer in the Greater Victoria area had a 50-lot subdivision and wanted to do passive house there. And it was a very unfavorable location for small, single-family passive house uh, buildings. The layout was of the subdivision, everything was wrong. But uh, from, from a performance perspective, anyhow. And um, so I was saying they needed a really efficient form to hit the target. And uh, they, the, the developer and his construction manager uh, were listening to me and they were saying, well, so basically you want us to sell boxes. And I said, well, basically. And they said, well, forget it. We can't sell boxes. But the developer's wife was there. She's an architect. She's listening. And she tells the guys to shut up, and give her 10 minutes. And I can see what she's doing on her computer because she's designing these buildings. And... Um, I watch her sort of play with the design. She starts with a box and then she starts, as I say, decorating it. You know, the garage goes here and the entry goes there and all this sort of thing, changes the materials. 10 minutes later, turns her monitor around and says, there, how does that look? And the developer and the construction manager look at it. These are sort of older guys. It looks great, we can sell that. And uh, so the construction manager, just out of curiosity, went and did some pricing on, the same floor area, uh, what, what it would mean for price if they made this simpler design. And they thought they already thought beforehand they had a simple design, but they didn't. And uh, the, the savings on drywall alone were $2,000 per house. So now other things would go up a lot, but uh, in the end, so it's a matter of designing. And if you look at these high performance buildings around the world, there's amazing buildings. And uh, some of them may look like classic structures they're filling in a historic setting. Uh, some of them are very contemporary, you know, so uh, they, and you saw some of the designs in the images today. So it's, it's really a question of getting a designer who wants to do this rather than just cranking out what they did last week. Uh, thank you, Rob. Before I uh, let you go, I wanted to also ask you about incentive programs. Uh, so there was a question in chat about an incentive program to encourage people to build to higher levels. And uh, thank you, uh, Robert, for uh, sharing the Near Zero initiative. Uh, but Rob, what do you think the role of incentive programs should or can be, as opposed to the, you know, the regulation, the minimum code requirement? It, to me, incentives and also public sector leadership, making sure public sector buildings all achieve these outcomes is really important because the the entire market can't go from where we are to where we need to be in one step. We need a graduated approach. That's one reason we like the step code. It just keeps moving the floor up. And uh, so the leaders are doing this today and have been doing it for a long time. Uh, and uh, But not everybody is. Not everybody is capable. And incentive programs just bring in a few more. And before this can be a base code, we need enough scale within the market so that the, the regulations can be effectively implemented. If we only have 3% of the market able to do this, we're just not going to get a building code implemented. So we, we need to bring the percentage up. And the step code, frankly, is really effective at doing that, at least that approach, if the details are well executed. Thank you. And I know I said last question, but I do have one last this time for real. Uh, there's a comment uh, or a question about the role of BC housing 
uh, how do you see they can play a more effective role, for example, requiring passive hospital performance for all the social housing or effort, affordable housing projects? Agencies like BC Housing, in fact, all public sector, if we're going to get where we need to go, need to, in my view, demonstrate the leadership. For an agency, by setting and build, setting RFP requirements at the level we need to be at for 2030. Now, in the case of BC Housing, this can be the most, should be, the most cost-effective outcome for, for them. These buildings, the operating costs, and the life cycle costs and so on are so much lower that they will be the lowest cost option on any reasonable uh, life cycle analysis and by quite a dramatic sense. And we're seeing this in Ontario quite a bit with a lot of affordable housing going in there that's passive house, including retrofits. So uh, the first ones can be expensive. There, you know, there's wrinkles, there's learning curve, there's all this stuff. Um, but that that's part of market transformation. You know, when you learn to swim or you learn to play a musical instrument, can you do it perfectly the first time? Not a chance. Uh, and if we set the bar so low that everybody can step over it first try, <clears throat> excuse me, but the bar just isn't where it needs to be. So BC Housing has demonstrated some, some really good leadership. They've done some great projects in different locations around the province. And I know some of them have been a learning experience. Um, hopefully, the, these agencies can soak up some of the learnings and pave the way. Um, having public buildings and affordable housing buildings that offer this level of comfort and air quality and health and durability and resilience, uh, it really takes away the ability of developers to say it can't be done. You know, when, when government's doing it, why can't, you know, the fancy developers? Thank you, Rob. So thank you very much again for your time. Uh, I really enjoyed this conversation. Uh, I'm sure all the attendants also uh, took a lot away from this. I would like to also thank everybody who joined us this afternoon. Please stay tuned for our upcoming Building Matters webinars. As I mentioned, I will be uh, sending a follow-up email to all of you uh, where I will include links to the various articles and reports uh, that, uh, well, that were mentioned during the presentation. So thank you very much for joining us. Have a great day.